Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'm Emily Molden, Executive Director of the Nantucket Land Council, and I'm very happy to welcome you to our third installation of Clean Water Topics on Tap. First, I just want to thank our sponsors, Donnell and Family Wines, Ernst Land Design, Cisco Brewers, and the Nantucket Shellfish Association. Without their support, these programs would not be possible. As you know, we've also been trying to promote some of our local aquaculture, and I would encourage you to contact Emil Bender from Hang Ten Raw Bar for some of his delicious oysters, or be sure to pick some of the other local oyster farmers' delicious oysters up at a seafood store near you. I know I have some waiting for me after the program, along with the delicious bottle of Donnell and Wine. So today's topic is green crabs, danger and delicacy. This, this presentation tonight is being offered as part of our first Green Crab Awareness Week, which is being presented by the Nantucket Land Council and the Mariah Mitchell Association. And you can find some more information on the rest of the programs this week on the Land Council's website and across our social media platforms. As you will learn, if you don't already know, green crabs are not native to our waters, but are an, event, an invasive species. Even though they have been here for quite some time, they hail from across the Atlantic. Their population has been increasing in recent years, and they've been wreaking havoc on regional fisheries such as softshell clams and mussels. Here on Nantucket, we're concerned about their role as a predator to our own shellfish, but we're also very concerned about the damage they may be doing to our already stressed and declining eelgrass beds. For those who aren't familiar with our work, the Land Council has been working to protect and preserve Nantucket's natural resources since 1974. In addition to our long-term work protecting open space and rare species habitat, we've dedicated even more of our efforts in the last 10 years to investigating the health of our ponds and harbors and promoting government policies to help preserve them. Back in 2017, after becoming more aware of the problems that green crabs were causing in other coastal communities, we began to investigate their population in Nantucket Harbor. We spent two summers collecting data through a mark recapture study in cooperation with the Mariah Mitchell Association to better characterize their population and demographics. Our efforts in 2018, however, resulted in very few captures which didn't leave us with enough data to really draw any significant conclusions. We believe that the cold weather and the harbor freeze that we experienced the winter before may have been enough to significantly impact the green crabs population that year. That of course would be a great thing for the ecosystem, but it wasn't so good for our own research. We have since changed our tactics somewhat and we're working to better understand not only how many crabs there are in our harbors, but where they can be found throughout Nantucket and Madiket harbors. This ultimately will help to inform a future fishery for green crabs if we are able to create a market for them. Following our main presentation this evening, RJ Turcott, the Land Council's resource ecologist, will be providing an update on an exciting new program we're launching this year to help inform and hopefully drive a softshell crab market using these pesky crabs right here on Nantucket. Before I introduce our speaker, just a couple of notes about our Zoom protocol. After the main presentation, there will be an opportunity for questions and answers. And I would just direct you to the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. That's where you'll be able to enter in any questions that you have for us to answer at the end of the program. Also, we will be providing on our website and hopefully through the chat during the program, a link to a flyer with some more information on green crabs as well as a copy of tonight's recipe so that all of you can either follow along or be sure to try it on your own later on. So our speaker tonight is Mary Parks. Mary Parks is currently the executive director of greencrab.org, an organization that's focused on developing a culinary market for green crabs throughout the Northeast. Their goal is not only to motivate the harvest and consumption of green crabs, which mitigates their invasive impact, but also to provide fishermen in vulnerable industries with an alternative source of income. Mary is originally from coastal Maine, and she has a background in sustainable fisheries science. She's also co-author of a recently published green crab cookbook. 
we do have these available for purchase and we'll also be giving a couple of them away tonight at the end of the program. So be sure to stick around. And with that, I would love to turn it over to Mary. Hello everyone. And tonight what we're going to be making is a green crab roe and sweet corn salad. Just to give a little bit more background about our organization first and also green crabs. So I work with an organization called greencrab.org and our goal as Emily mentioned is to motivate the consumption of green crabs. So what we do is work to develop culinary markets and this looks like everything from developing recipes, working with local chefs, getting green crabs into restaurants to also building supply chains, which involves working with everyone from the fishermen to the wholesaler to all the steps in between. Um, and we also develop and produce a lot of free resources and recipes that you could find on our website, greencrab.org. Tonight, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be cooking with green crab roe. Now, why this is one of my favorite ways in which to prepare green crabs is because even though green crabs are an invasive species here in Massachusetts, if you hop across the pond to Venice, you'll find that they're actually considered a culinary delicacy. And so in Venice, they are shucked for their roe or caviar, which is known as massanete. It can be eaten in the half shell, it can be eaten in salads like we're gonna eat tonight. Um, and it can also be served with a squeeze of lemon, sauteed, prepared in a bunch of different ways. The Venetians, as RJ is gonna cover later on, also are into molting soft shell green crabs. It's an established fishery that's existed in Venice for hundreds and hundreds of years. And people actually travel from all over the world just to make moeke season, which is known as soft shell green crab season in Venice. Um, in the rest of Italy, this is also a big thing, just not as big in Venice. Green crabs in the rest of Italy are known as moleke instead of moeke. And you might also see that green crab roe is called masanetta instead of masanete. Um, so to get started, what we're going to do, we had a little bit of a mix up this evening in terms of our fishermen not being able to get us fresh green crabs, but no fear. We have a video that we're going to jump to right now um, that is going to talk about the process of how you shuck masanete um, or green crab roe. I'll be using those two terms interchangeably throughout the tutorial. Um, just a couple quick notes at first. So this is a great recipe to do if you're looking to also prepare some other green crab dishes. And the reason I say that is because A, you get a lot of shells that are gonna be left over from shucking them for roe. And so you're able to use these in a stock, you can use them in a broth, you can cook with the crab legs. And also you can only use the female crabs to shuck roe. Roe is gonna be available anytime between now and late fall. There's kind of a mini summer season that we get um, here in Massachusetts and the rest of New England where the green crabs actually start producing roe a little earlier. One of the reasons why it's so important that we eat green crab roe is because a single green crab can produce up to 185,000 eggs per year. And I'm gonna show you what a female green crab looks like in comparison to a male green crab. So here I have a frozen female green crab. You're gonna see on the bottom right here that it has what we call the apron. So this apron right here is actually where the crab's gonna store its eggs. And when the crab is gravid, which I'll mention in the video coming up on how to shuck green crab roe, um, you're not gonna to wanna to eat them when they're gravid. This is when they push the eggs out of their body. It's not super yummy to eat. However, most of them are just gonna be females this time of year with the roe contained inside the crab. That being said, you might not see all your crabs are gonna be having green crab roe inside of them. However, as I was mentioning before, you can still use these in a stock or a broth, shuck them for green crab legs and whatnot. You're also gonna have, if you're getting a batch of green crabs, you're gonna end up having these male crabs. And one of my favorite things to do with male green crabs is shuck them for crab legs. You can eat them just like you would eat kind of a tiny snow crab leg or rock crab legs. Um, we love to serve them up buttery and a little bit spiced. And for all those recipes, you can check out greencrab.org slash eat, where we have a bunch of free recipes. And for our ultimate collection of recipes, make sure to check out our cookbook, which is again available for purchase. So with that little bit of background, just gonna show you folks one more time, because this is so critical for being able to shuck roe, is looking at the bottom of these crabs. So again, we have a female right here, and right here we have a male. 
I've heard some people compare that the bottom of the male and the female green crab is like looking at the Capitol building versus the Washington Monument. It's an easy way to identify the underneath. You're not gonna be looking at color. You're really just gonna be looking for the presence of this little flap right here, which is known as the apron. So with that being said, we're now gonna go into a process, a video that I filmed a few weeks ago, where I go through the process of actually steaming and shucking green crabs for row. And then I'll see you on the other side where we'll be creating this delicious summer salad with sweet corn. Female crabs for roe. Roe is super, super yummy to use in a lot of dishes. Um, and to start off the process, we're going to be separating male from female crabs. Now, how you tell the difference when looking at male and female crabs is by looking at their underbelly. So if I look at this female crab, you're gonna notice this right here, which is known as the apron. When the female is gonna be ready to release her eggs, she's actually going to um, extrude them and hold them in this little apron apparatus right here. I'm also gonna show you a male crab just for difference. You see the difference? This right here, we have a male crab and you'll see looking underneath that he doesn't have that same apron. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm going to shuck crab legs off of these male crabs and then use the bodies for stock. And if you wanna get an idea of how to do this, you can head over to our first episode on our Instagram TV where we discuss shucking green crab legs. So here I've gone ahead and separated male from female crabs. Again, you can tell the difference because looking at females, they have this apron underneath. And when I look at the males in here, you'll notice they don't have that apron. It's a different shape on the underbelly. So quick note, if you see any females that have extruded the row, and the row is this orange mass right here, and this orange mass below this crab, you wanna leave those out. Once the rows come outside of the body, it doesn't taste very good. Um, and it tastes a little bit grainy. It doesn't have a lot of flavor. So we're gonna leave these guys out of our stock and we're not gonna shuck them or harvest this row. So now it's been about eight minutes. As you can see, ooh, the crabs are pretty well steamed, bright red in color. The female and crabs are now cooling off. I'm gonna give these about 20 minutes while I finish shucking the crab legs off of the male crabs. Um, make sure that you give the crabs a little bit of time to cool off first so you don't burn yourself, and second, because the roe needs some time to set after it's been cooked. So now that my female crabs have cooled off after steaming, I am going to go ahead and show you folks how to shuck the row out of them. For this process, I'm gonna need two things. The first is this little shucking tool that I have here. This is gonna help me scoop the meat out of the green crab. I also have a metal chopstick right here, which is gonna help me push the row out of the under section. If you're curious about where to get these, we do have some available for sale on our website. Um, as part of our shucking set. And you can also find them on, you know, a bunch of other places. You're gonna find this labeled most often as a crab pick. So to start off, I'm gonna take a female green crab. I'm gonna put my thumb underneath this portion right here. And gently push off the carapace. And I can see right here that this is a crab that has roe. So the green crab roe is gonna be right here. It's bright orange. And we're also gonna find some in the back of the crab. As you can see down here, I have a couple of crabs that were female crabs, but didn't have roe right now. We are being in July and kind of like the second season of um, green crab roe. They're most commonly, they're gonna produce roe in the fall. However, there is kind of a second season of when they produce eggs. A great part about harvesting green crabs with their row is you're removing them right before they release a ton of eggs into the environment. And as we know, green crabs are an incredibly destructive invasive species. So not only are you getting this delicious green crab row, you're also helping prevent their spread. So now that I have the carapace off the top, I'm gonna go in and I'm going to take my shucking tool, this part, 
and scoop it in the back right here and jiggle it out partially. And then I'm gonna take on the other side and pop this out. And the result is this big chunk of green crab roe. And on the back right here, this is actually crab meat. I can rinse this off a little bit and take off some of these fatty bits to review, reveal the pure green crab roe. Super delicious. Now for the underside of the crab, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use a chopstick instead. So for this, I'm first gonna flip the crab over, take it by its apron, pop off this little apron. So it makes pushing this rod easier. See the bright orange row. I'm then gonna take this chopstick and I'm gonna wiggle it underneath the crab here. And I just kind of wiggled it out. I'm then gonna take my shucking tool again and push out and see how incredibly bright this green crab row is. And there we go, that's just from one crab. Beautiful. So I'm gonna repeat this process a few more times with female crabs. Again, I'm not gonna see the row probably in all of the crabs, but I definitely will in some of them. Taking it by the hinges, popping this off the back. And I can see this one just on the sides right here as that super, super bright orange row. I'm gonna take my scooping tool, go along the back side of each side of the carapace and pull out this big whole chunk of row. I'm gonna take off on this one some of the shell was attached, so I'm just gonna take that off. Here we have this big, beautiful chunk of row. Some people do use a spoon for this process. I would recommend getting one of these shucking tools just because it makes it a lot easier. You're gonna get much bigger chunks of meat. So again, I just moved, uh, removed the apron off of this crab. I'm gonna go ahead. This time I'm just gonna try using my shucking tool and wiggle underneath to get my second serving of row out of the body. So one quick note about shucking masanete and pulling off the top carapace. If you don't wanna use your nails for this process and you wanna use a tool instead to save your nails, I would recommend using this part of the shucking tool. It's gonna to be a little bit trickier, but you can essentially just wiggle it under and pop off this portion of the carapace. All right, so with a little bit of movie magic, we can pretend that this right here is the same green crab row that was just shucked. Um, this was from roughly 12 crabs. Um, again, not all of the crabs had green crab row, but most of them did. And here I have a solid portion of row that I'm gonna be using for my recipe coming up. If you're interested in seeing what green crab row looks like after the meat and fat around it has been removed, you get a look right here. We have a photo by Chatham Fisherman and photographer Jamie Bassett. Um, and he has taken some really beautiful photos of just the row on their own. That being said, we're gonna be using the row, which is gonna be Venetian style. Um, Massanetic technically is actually the fat, green crab meat and green crab row all combined together. And what happens is when you saute this up a little bit or you just eat it straight, 
you get not only that richness of the roe, but you also are going to get the depth of flavor that comes from the fat, as well as a little bit of sweetness from the meat. So this right here, I'm gonna put aside for later, because what we're gonna do starting off is actually making a quick pickle out of some diced shallots. So here I have equal parts, apple cider vinegar and water. I'm gonna turn my pan up to medium high heat and I'm going to let this start simmering. I'm gonna add in a bit of salt, a bit of sugar, and I'm just waiting until these ingredients down here start to dissolve. After that's done, I'm going to pour it over my shallots and I'm gonna then use the same pan to heat up the green crab roe. Um, while this is simmering a little bit, I thought I'd talk a bit more about green crabs invasive impact, specifically in New England and Massachusetts. Um, so a lot of people know that green crabs are bad for local shellfish populations, specifically soft shell clams, um, as well as mussels and oysters. Green crabs not only prey upon these, but they can also eat them in their larval forms. Um, and they are a big, big problem, especially in Maine um, and the North Shore in terms of the fact that they prey a lot on juvenile soft shell clams. That being said, they also outcompete local shellfish, eating a lot of the same um, food and staying in the same habitat. As um, a lot of local shellfish outcompeting them, they'll also prey upon baby lobsters and other baby crabs, and they largely outcompete a lot of um, local crab species as well. That being said, one of the most important things that the green crab does is destroy eelgrass habitat. And eelgrass is a super important nursery habitat for a lot of the finfish we love to eat, a lot of vulnerable bird and shellfish and um, even turtle populations and bird populations. So now I have, now that it's just simmering, and I'm just gonna pour this over my mixture of diced shallots. And I'm kind of going to shake this up and put this aside for the spill for a few minutes. Now my pan is still hot. And now I'm going to turn this to medium heat. I'm going to take about half a tablespoon of extra virgin olive oil and coat the bottom of my pan. I prefer using olive oil with something else just because you're cooking the massanete for such a short amount of time. It's for extra flavor. It's also how Venetians and Italians cook with green crab roe and it's super, super yummy. So now I have this whole green crab roe, hard enough, that just came out of my crabs, let's pretend. And what I'm actually gonna do is mash this with a fork so that I get a consistency that's a little bit smaller, about the size, I want about uh, caviar chunks are about the size of like a peppercorn. So I'm gonna mash this up while my, eat, my oil is heating. You can also use a food processor for this process if you want a really creamy pate, but for this salad, I kind of like to see the chunks of green crab roe. I think it looks super, super pretty. And you can be rough with it too. I mean, some chunks can be bigger than others. I'm literally just mashing it up with a fork on a plate. like so and this looks a lot more appetizing when you see it up close without this washed out cooking light now that things have started to heat up i'm going to toss this in a pan and i'm just very 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 lightly sauteing this i don't want it to firm up i just want to add a little bit of heat and i'm kind of coating it in olive oil also for flavor. At this point too, I'm going to add a little bit of fresh crushed pepper, a little bit more salt, and you can see it's barely been any time at all. I'm just waiting until 
I essentially don't have any moisture around the bits of the crab. And then I'm going to take a dry sherry. You can add as much or as little as you like. I like to add about a tablespoon. <laughs> and cook up the green crab roe just until it is evaporated. You'll notice that it changes from being a little bit grainy to being pretty creamy. It's a nice way of adding a little bit of moisture to the green crab roe so that and when it's cooked in the massanette a little bit, um, when it's cooked in the olive oil a little bit, it might you know, tense up a little bit. And so this adds a little bit of moisture back into it and flavor. And you can see the result is that you get these little, almost like pearls. I'm trying to get a good chunk. It's almost like pearls of caviar. So now I'm going to add everything together for my sweet corn salad. So to start off, I have one and a half cups of sweet corn here. And I'm gonna add in as my base. And then using this bowl, I'm gonna add in the juice from a lemon, a little bit more sugar, a little bit more salt, a little bit more black pepper, some olive oil, and then I'm actually using this pickle liquid right here. I'm going to take about a tablespoon of this liquid and add it back in to this mixture. I like the combination of apple cider vinegar and lemon. It gives it a little bit of tartness, but not too much sourness and acidity. That up, I have some dill here as well that I'm going to add in. I'm using a combination of some dill that I had from my garden and also some dried dill I had on hand. You can use whatever you have available. I'm going to add in this beautiful green crab roe. And in an ideal world, I probably would have set this aside and let this cool for about 10 minutes. I prefer to have this salad a little bit cold. I love serving this. And as you might have seen in the promotion photos, we had a photo of um, the sweet corn salad, which was served in the upper half of the green crab shell over some ice. Super fun way of kind of framing this like you would, uh, or plating this as you would like an oyster on the half shell, which is fun, it's a fun little appetizer. After this, I'm going to add in my shallots. Just strain those off the top. And this is one shallot that I've done in the quick pickle. Another great thing about this dish, especially because the green crab is cooked and it's pretty acidic, is it's a great picnic beach recipe. All you need is a cooler pack. It can be served cold and it's super, super delicious. Right, so I'm incorporating that. Lastly, I'm just going to add some fresh basil. It's an Italian sweet corn salad and they love to put basil in their sweet corn salad. And I have a little bit of spicy globe basil from our garden as well. And lastly, and I like to keep these two separate just because everybody's tastes are different in terms of how much vinaigrette you put on or whatever you want to call this. It's kind of a vinaigrette. Um, that I have here, which is a combination of the pickle juice, lemon, some olive oil, some salt and pepper. And I'm gonna add that in slowly. And 
and toss together. And here I have super beautiful, delicious sweet corn salad. You can serve it in a bunch of different ways. Um, you can, you know, anything from, you know, on top of some bread, again, as a, a side dish, as a little appetizer. And it's also a great way that you can cook with a pretty low number of green crabs. So if you only have, say, 10 female green crabs from a scavenging day at the beach, you can easily make this super, super delicious dish. Again, as I mentioned in the beginning of the video, um, if you have both male and female green crabs to work with, definitely check out some other recipes for working with those male crabs. And we highly recommend that you use the leftover shells afterwards to create a stock. Green crabs make super delicious and flavorful stocks, which can be the base for anything from pastas to risottos and more. And I'm going to put this in a bowl for myself to try and show you guys one more time the final result. And I have a super pretty sweet corn salad. Let's taste it. Mm -mm -mm. So good. Very fresh. The dill is probably one of my favorite parts of it. And again, what I did for this dish is I actually used frozen green crab roe. If you're looking to freeze green crab roe, what I recommend doing is putting it in a little ball on a pl on plastic wrap, squeezing it and squeezing all of the air out, rolling it up, wrapping it a couple times, putting it in your freezer. And then you can pop it back in the fridge after storing it for up to two months. And it makes this super, super tasty um, summer dish. It's awesome. Great, thank you so much, Mary. I have certainly multiple times been saddened that the pandemic has forced us into these virtual programs, but I don't know if I've been quite as sad about it as I am right now, because that looks so good and I would really, really love to be able to try some in person. I definitely look forward to uh, trying to cook some uh, on my own. So before we get into questions and answers, and I certainly would encourage anyone who's participating that has a question to go ahead and start to enter those into the Q&A box. But I want to just turn it over to RJ Turcott to speak for a few minutes about another project that we have starting this summer that hopefully will help to inform that soft shell crab fishery and market in the future on Nantucket. It's a pretty fun uh, little program we're using some volunteers for this year, and we hope that it will be informative for local fishermen and, and for the community to take advantage of these crabs in a culinary way in the future. So over to you, RJ. Awesome. Hello, everyone. So as Emily sort of spoke to earlier, right at the beginning, of the presentation. The Land Council for the past few years has been tracking green crabs in both of our harbors and we're pretty aware that A, we have a lot of them in our harbors, a lot of them, and B, that they're detrimental. And we've conveyed that through our website and to the public at talks and things like that. And one of the most common questions we get from people is, and enthusiastic, what about soft shell green crabs? And the answer for a while was, well, we just, we don't really have any soft shell green crabs available to experiment with. We don't really know when they molt. We don't really know what to look for. So we started looking into starting our own soft shell green crab sort of pilot program to teach ourselves how to identify a crab that's about to molt and then keep it until it does and then have fresh soft shell green crabs to for people to explore cooking with and to help educate the public that this is an invasive species and we can do something about it and have a nice dinner. So right now we have one green crab condo, which I actually learned that term from a colleague of Mary's, John Taggart, who is doing a similar thing and all a green crab condo is, is oyster, oyster cage 
with dividers that keep the crabs separate from each other because when they do molt, they'll cannibalize each other and then you won't have any soft shell crabs. Your fellow green crabs will have just eaten them. So we built one of those condos this spring and we have it tied up to the shellfish hatchery in town. And we check it daily to see if the green crabs were storing molt. So if you're interested and want to come check it out and volunteer with us, shoot me an email or give us a call. We'd love to have you. We're trying to get the word out and get more people on board with soft shell crabs. So that's that. And do you want to do this now, Emily, or do you want to wait till the very end? What do you think? I think we can wait. Let's do a couple of uh, questions and answers first, and then we'll get over to the uh, cookbook giveaway in uh, a few minutes. I do have one question that has come in for you, Mary, that has a definite uh, culinary bent to it. And it's from one of our participants who's asking, when I want to make a stock with the green crabs, can I leave in the females that have already extruded the row or should I discard them? And then there's a follow-up question asking if there's a preparation that you would recommend for both male and female crabs to use for stock before cooking. Absolutely. So while this question was being asked, I just briefly got out what my stock pot looks like. So I can kind of go over the process that I use um, first of steaming them and creating broth. So here I have a two layer stock pot and it actually makes it really easy. So if you want to, what you can do is put some water in just so it goes to this level right here and you'll see it coming right out of the bottom. You'll see that this stock pot has a little bit of space at the bottom, or maybe you won't, but essentially right here is a gap. And so what I do personally is I put the female crabs in here, steam them for a row, leave that same water in there, and then you can put all the males and the females in afterwards, crush them up, make a super delicious stock, and then it's kind of in one fell swoop. In regards to the gravid females, honestly, I, I just wouldn't use them. Some people do use them in their stock, but depending on the time of year, they tend to be pretty, pretty scarce most of the time. I would say that maybe like one in every 20 females right now is going to have gravid row um, at a most, but I've also had batches that haven't had any gravid females. This will become more common in the fall, which is like the primary mating season. Um, that being said, what happens though with that gravid row is when you cook it or even steam it, is it kind of brittle and falls apart. Um, and that's because the whole entire protein structure of the row has really changed at that point. I personally wouldn't put it in, your, in the stock just because you're gonna get kind of these big chunks of little bubbly row. And I do filter my stock both through, what I would essentially do when the stock was done is I would lift this out, removing all the green crabs, leaving a stock underneath. And then I would also use a finer mesh strainer. That being said, if you're using the gravid females, you still might have some of that row come through. I personally just don't like the flavor very much. Um, but then again, afterwards and after you're creating something like a stock, you can easily put those shells in your compost. They make an absolutely wonderful compost, super high in chitin and calcium, which is great for plants' immune systems. In terms of a recipe that works really well for males and females, I'm just going to reiterate what I said at the top, which is personally, when I go ahead and prepare green crabs, I do them in three ways. I sort my crabs into males and females. I then I'm going to steam my female green crabs, put those aside, shuck them for stock or shuck them for masanete later. And then with my male crabs, I'm actually going to go through the process of shucking their legs off. And this involves actually working with live male green crabs. We go over this process um, in our shucking tutorial that we have on our Instagram TV channel. And we also have a recipe on our website about how to make green crab legs. It is a process that involves taking the legs off of live male green crabs, which to a lot of people can be a little bit much um, because it involves ripping the legs off a live crab. It's actually one of the fastest ways to kill crabs, especially compared to steaming them. And if you're wearing gloves and you're not the faint of heart, it's a great way to eat some delicious crab legs. So I would recommend doing that at the same time that you're doing your masanete and then throwing all the scraps, the bodies of the males, the leftovers from shucking row, put all of that in your stock pot, 
mash it up, let it um, simmer for about four hours. And then you have this beautiful green crab stock. You have legs that you can use for one dish. You have a roe that you can use for another dish. And those three ingredients are really the base of most of the recipes that we have both in our cookbook and online. That being said, one more caveat, which is there are recipes where you can use the whole crab and it's a little bit different. So my co-author Tan Tai goes into this technique um, of creating bun roux, which is a Vietnamese dish that involves crushing small rice paddy crabs and filtering it so all the meat comes to the surface. Um, I highly recommend you check out her website, which is known as Green Cab Crab Cafe. She has some absolutely incredible recipes. And this is a great technique if you're essentially looking to get some meat out of the crab without going through the process of shucking them for meat, creating broth. And so you get this delicious, flavorful um, broth dish in the end with big chunks of meat at the surface. And again, she has that recipe both in the cookbook and also on Green Crab Cafe, which is her blogging platform with a bunch of green crab recipes as well. Sorry, very long answer there. I also wanted to just let folks know a little bit more about how to get green crabs, how to have access to them and how to trap them and get them so that we can actually try some of these recipes at home. So I was wondering if um, Mary, maybe you could touch a little bit on what is required or necessary for people to actually go out and catch their own green crabs. And then I also would love if you could talk a little bit about the Shuck at Home program that greencrab.org is involved in that I know we have discussed trying to team up with you on maybe next summer when we do our green crab week again. So I believe after this video, there'll be a little bit of a link sent out from the Department of Marine Fisheries. Usually in order to trap green crabs, it's a super, super simple process of either signing up for a quick permit or you can actually just go out and fish them recreationally on your own. I would recommend checking both with the Department of Marine Resources as well as with your local shellfish constable, who is kind of essentially the liaison between the Department of Marine Resources and fishermen as well as recreational fishers. That being said, um, in most places in New England, you don't usually need a permit to go out and trap on your own in most places. There are some caveats to this. So depending on how you're fishing green crabs, for example, if you're in Cape Cod and you're using something like a modified lobster trap to trap green crabs, you do want to keep an eye out for whale regulations and other regulations that would potentially limit your ability to use those type of fishing gears. Um, so again, in a lot of areas in Cape Cod, um, and I might be true around Nantucket as well, I'm not entirely sure. You do want to pay attention to that timeline in terms of when you're able to put your traps in the water. That being said, if you're just going out and foraging green crabs on your own, you should pretty much always be in the clear if you're not using a trap, especially if you're out at the beach, if you're out on the shoreline. Um, and even though green crabs don't like kind of the sandy um, openness of the beach, here in New England, we have a lot of rocky beaches. We also have a lot of beaches that have tide pools on the side that they're gonna have bits of rocky um, habitat that's a little bit more complex. And also that being said, I mean, last summer I went to Revere Beach a bunch and for all the stuff that I heard about green crabs not liking the open beach, I literally just, I saw them everywhere. I mean, seagulls are going down and picking them up and dropping them and eating where you, can, you can't really go to a beach in Massachusetts from my experience and not see some remnants of a green crab. And they can actually be um, one of the easiest ways to get them is foraging them. One thing that we're going to be coming out in the upcoming weeks is a soft shell foraging guide and a kid friendly green crabs at the beach guide. There are a couple of things that you're going to want to keep in mind when you're um, foraging for green crabs. Definitely keep an eye out to make sure that you're not in a super polluted body of water. That being said, they're not filter feeders in the way that clams and a lot of the other shellfish we like to eat are. And so it's not really the same concerns in terms of harmful contaminants. On the other hand, how do you get green crabs every day? How do you get green crabs at the store or from your local seafood provider? Which is a question that I think for most people 
most people aren't going to be able to go out to the beach and forage for their own food, especially in the middle of a pandemic. And so part of what we're doing at greencrop.org is working with more wholesalers to provide them with green crops from local fishermen. Um, and particularly, we've been working a lot with the Shellfish Broker, which is Jamie Bassett's company based in Chatham, and they are the premier retailer of culinary grade green crabs. Um, and they put a lot of work into this, especially um, in getting smaller portions of green crabs available to wholesalers, because most of the time they're sold in the bait market, these big, big bags, kind of hard for most chefs to work with. And so part of our shuck at home effort has been, how do we get more green crabs into the hands of wholesalers that can distribute to restaurants? How do we give green crabs directly to restaurants to get more chefs cooking with them? And the third part of that has been direct deliveries to people. And so a few weeks back, we actually worked from early, early in the morning to about 11.30 p.m. at night, delivering green crabs directly to people's doors in the greater Boston area. Um, we had a lot of people have super positive feedback and they'd be interested again. In fact, we had so much positive feedback that we're going to be implementing a free green crab pickup program at an affiliated retailer in the greater Boston area. If you're interested in that and also learning about more events in our Shuck at Home effort, you can go to greencrab.org slash shuck at home. If you go to greencrab.org as well, it's gonna be right at the top of the page. Um, and this initiative has really been, how can we get more people cooking with green crabs in the culinary industry? How can we get more wholesalers moving green crabs? How can we get more fishermen fishing green crabs? And how do we get more people eating them? Um, and even though with the pandemic, it's been super, super challenging to restaurants, we've seen a lot of them have started to pivot to these alternative business models, particularly takeout. Um, and so we've actually seen, we did one or two test weeks with Wolf's Fish in Boston, and they were actually able to distribute green crabs to a bunch of restaurants in the greater Boston area. Um, and it's been pretty exciting. And in fact, next week and this week on the menu at Nightshade Noodle Bar in Lynn, you'll be able to see them as a full-time menu item. And we're also going to keep posting updates on where they're available and where you can find them. One more quick thing outside of our shuck at home effort that I always like to ask people about is if in your if you're in a place like Nantucket or you know anywhere in New England where you're at a supermarket, you're at a fish market, a lot of the times it can be a good thing just to ask that fish market if they have access to green crabs. The answer will most likely be no, we don't have green crabs available right now, or what is that? It's a great chance to not only initiate that conversation with your local fishmonger, but most of the time their wholesaler will have access to green crabs. And so if you're asking about it, if people have this demand, if you're able to place a special order, a lot of the times it can happen. And so I highly encourage people, no matter what fish market or supermarket they're at, if you have a fish counter, go up to your fishmonger and chat with them a little bit about green crabs. And you can also find a list of where to buy green crabs from wholesalers and fishermen on our website as well. Great, thanks for that, Mary. I think the Shuck at Home program is a great example of what we can start to try to do out here on Nantucket a little bit more. I love the idea of starting to ask for green crabs at our local fish markets. I know RJ and I are starting to talk with some of the um, distributors and wholesalers and, and fish markets about the soft shell crab program that we're doing and trying to stir up some interest in uh, providing them to customers in the future. Um, I want to just reiterate uh, another question that came up while you were talking that's just asking when collecting green crabs, presumably foraging for them at the beach, do they have a defining feature which differentiates them from other crabs that we should not take? So this is a great question, also because it can be kind of misleading to a lot of people who see a crab on the beach, they see it as green, they think it is a green crab. Most people would assume that green crabs are green. They're actually a bunch of different colors. And Jimmy Elliott talked about this, I know, a bit last night in his presentation with you folks. Um, but green crabs, depending on where they are in their life uh, sex, uh, cycle and reproductive cycle, can actually be a bunch of different colors from light green to dark blue to dark brown to bright red to bright orange. Um, but the defining 
for example, you can see right here, these crabs are a bunch of different colors. We have a female and a male. However, the most important characteristic when you're actually looking at green crabs is seeing if it has five points on each side of its eye. And so as you can see kind of in our cookbook cover right here, we have one, two, three, four, five points on either side of the crab. One, two, three, four, five. And that is gonna be your best indicator on whether or not you're looking for a green crab, especially here in the East Coast. They, when you see a crab on the beach, especially if you're in certain areas with high green crab populations, you are gonna see them in all shapes and sizes, different parts of their life cycle. Again, always look at the five points on either side. Don't go by the color. Um, and also keep an eye out too, because sand crabs can be a somewhat similar shape and confuse people. There are also some other crab species as well that look somewhat similar, but again, with the five points on either side of the eye, you should be pretty much all set for identifying them as a green crab. Great, thanks for that. So I also just want to let people know that as we continue with our green crab research, we do have a letter of authorization from DMF to be going out and taking green crabs from the harbors. And we often end up with way more than we need. And when we're going out just to simply do a count of the population from different parts of the harbor, we pull traps in with a bunch of green crabs that we're certainly not gonna put back out there. So if anybody is interested in getting some green crabs from us over the next several weeks throughout the summer, please just reach out to us at the office, RJ, myself, or Meg, and let us know, get in touch, because I can guarantee you that we can find you some green crabs if you're having a hard time getting your hands on them yourself. Uh, I just want to put another shout out to our Green Crab Week that we are presenting this week with the Mariah Mitchell Association. I believe that Meg put a link in the chat for you where you can find more information and also a lot of the videos and tutorials that we have released this week and will continue to through the day tomorrow. As Mary mentioned, there's a great researcher, Jimmy Elliott, who did a presentation through the Mariah Mitchell Association last night that was a little bit more on the scientific population and uh, demographics of green crabs throughout New England. And I'm sure that that recording will be available as well. I am now going to turn it over to RJ to do a cookbook giveaway with a couple of Mary's great cookbooks. And maybe RJ, before you actually do the giveaway, you could just touch on um, the letter of authorization we got. And as far as uh, folks getting green crabs on their own out here on Nantucket, what any, any tips you have for what they might wanna know. Okay, yeah. So the letter of authorization for us, it was 10 bucks. If you're just doing things recreationally, it's free. You can either give the Department of Marine Fisheries a call or they have the form to fill out on their website. And they're not, they're just, they just wanna keep track of who is catching green crabs and sort of look at it from a data standpoint. So they're not regulating how many you can keep or size or anything like that. They're just trying to keep track of this population as well. So it's a great way to help the state with their data work as well. So. That's that on the letter of authorization. And I literally have green crabs alive right now, if any of you are interested. And we also, Emily and I made fertilizer, a batch of fertilizer last week to for this week for green crab week. So if anyone's interested in trying some fertilizer on their garden, reach out to me because we have a whole bottle of that as well. So throughout the summer, we almost always have green crabs or can get those of you curious about cooking them, green crabs. We have a lot of them on, it, on Nantucket. So as Emily said, we're gonna give away two signed copies of this beautiful green crab cookbook by Mary. And the way I'm gonna do it is the first two people to type into the chat, the defining characteristic on the underside of the crab will get the free cookbooks. And we have a dozen more as well to buy at the Land Council office. So. Start typing. Mm -hmm. 
five points on either side of the eye. That's the defining characteristic on top. I mean, I guess I should have specified how to tell if they're male or female. It's a better hint. What's that part of the crab called? There we go. Apron, Victoria, and Graham. Awesome. Awesome. So you guys get free copies. And like I said, we have 12 more. They're amazing books, amazing pictures. I had no idea how to cook a green crab before I read her book. So reach out to us if you guys want to purchase one. Great. Thank you, RJ. And thanks again, Mary, for joining us. I definitely look forward to trying this recipe and many more. Uh, I also want to thank everyone for tuning in and watching our clean water topics on tap this week. Please check out the website for more offerings from our Green Crab Week with Mariah Mitchell Association. We hope to have some more interactive programs as part of uh, this Green Crab Week next year. We have one more clean water topics on tap that will be presented in September. And that's going to be on coastal plastics, another really important water quality issue on Nantucket and across the entire planet. We're really gonna be excited to uh, have Graham Durovich from the town's DPW do a presentation for us about coast coastal plastics and some research that we have going on here on Nantucket with regard to that. So please keep your eyes out for uh, information on how to tune in to that program in September. Thanks again to all of our sponsors and to the Nantucket Land Council's Water Fund who helps to make these programs possible. We're gonna have a closing slide with some additional resources on it, including the Division of Marine Fisheries website. Um, certainly if you don't get a chance to copy any of that down, you can always reach out to us at the Land Council for some more information and to follow up with any additional questions. So thanks again. Thank you.